Good morning and welcome to Read the Bible for Life. And that is exactly what we're doing. We are reading the Word of God and immersing ourselves in it, asking Him to speak to us as we get into His Word so that we know who He is, so that we know what He has said, because He is always faithful and true to His Word. And we want to be lining our lives up with it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, how we thank you so much. Oh, Lord God, we just want to pause right now and say thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus Christ that you might provide for us the way back to right relationship with you, that we might know you intimately, that we might fellowship with you, that we might be in relationship with you, that we might be able to learn to hear your voice, to walk with you and talk with you, to be filled by you, to be used by you for your glory and ultimately also for our own good. We are so thankful that you are so gracious and loving and merciful. So, Father, we ask this morning that you will speak to us. Spirit of the living God, give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are wrapping up Job, and then we're going to move into the first four chapters of the book of Exodus. So I know you probably had some some great discussion in your small groups. And as we look at the book of Job, I want us to think about a couple of things. And one of them is the question we always hear, and that is, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, first of all, I want you to know that that is um, a question that has great error in it. Because, first of all, there are no good people. The Bible tells us... (laughs) The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the better question might be, why do good things ever happen to bad people? I mean, why does God allow good things to happen to those of us who have not only inherited a sin nature, but have chosen to rebel against his word and chosen to go our own way? And we still do it. Even those who have been brought into right relationship with Jesus Christ can slip back into the flesh and old ways of thinking and doing, and yet God in his grace and mercy woos us and draws us back to himself. The Bible is very clear that it is his loving kindness that draws us to repentance. Now be sure he will discipline us, but he disciplines us for our own good, for our protection, to bring us back into the protective cover of a right relationship with him. So we are all sinners and we live on a broken planet. Not only did that sin impact all of humanity, it impacted the earth that we live on. Because when God was giving the curse and he was speaking to Adam, what did he say? Now your work is going to have toil. Thorns and thistles and weeds are going to be a part of what was once an enjoyable experience of tending the garden. Work was there before the fall. The toil and the burden came after the fall. So we need to remember that. And also we need to remember that there is always more going on than meets the eye. And there's always more at stake in every spiritual battle than we're aware of. And I want you to know something else. Every battle at its core is a spiritual battle. And we need to understand that we are not fighting, as the Bible tells us, against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers of darkness in heavenly places. And we need to be reminded of that because we can so awesome, oftentimes be short-sighted and think it's the natural, it's a person, it's an event, it's a crisis, when it is not. It is a spiritual battle that we are in, and we are to fight it with spiritual weapons. And that's how we do it with the Word of God, And with the shield of faith that we lift up against the fiery darts of the enemy who would want us to doubt God, to doubt his goodness. So as we look at Job and we see his friends came and they sat with him in in silence for seven days. And Gene did such a great job sharing the first couple of chapters last week and talking about how really that was the best gift they could give him. It was just the ministry of presence, of being there with him, of grieving with him as he was grieving. We are to mourn with those who mourn and to rejoice with those who rejoice. And so just sharing in that, you don't have to have the right answer. So in the midst of all that, as we look at these people who gave him counsel, whose counsel do we believe? (laughs) In the day in which we live, whose counsel do we believe? Because in our day, there are many opportunities for us to hear other people's opinions. In fact, we have so many more opportunities now than just a generation before me. We've got news, we have television, even sitcoms, we have the internet, we have social media. And there are so many intelligent and very articulate and persuasive people out there sharing their opinions. And if you're listening to them in the natural, not lining up what they're saying with the word of God, you can go, that sounds logical, that's reasonable. I mean, really, that sounds like this person may be right. How do we know? We come back to the word of God. I don't care how reasonable it sounds. 
to our natural mind, does it line up with the truth of God's word? If it does not, it's a lie. That's why we immerse ourselves in the truth so that we can detect the lie. Because we are easily deceived. We know that as we read through scripture and we see others who have been deceived by the evil one, beginning with Eve and going all the way through. When we lean on our own understanding, we can be led astray. So we must go into the word of God and trust and acknowledge him in every area, in every decision, so that we are making decisions, choosing according to the truth of his word as he's revealed it to us. We need to measure everything by the word of God. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why we're reading through Scripture systematically, doing it chronologically, so that we know who God says He is, how He has revealed Himself, and then how we are to respond to that revelation. Because God has made it very clear to us in His Word. I had the neat opportunity while I was visiting with Lindsay and Ryan and their children this past weekend. Ivy will be five in March. That's so hard to believe. And we celebrated Ruthie's third birthday. And then Charlie's almost five months old. So you can imagine what my weekend was like. It was so much fun. I did a lot of reading and playing. And we just really had a, a super time. But one of the highlights for me was Sunday night, and that was getting to go with Lindsay to her discipleship group. She's actually leading two, working through the chronological Bible, one on Sunday night and one in her home on Thursday mornings. And so the Sunday night group, they had just finished Hannah and were moving into the kingdom era. So I got to review with them, beginning in Genesis, and tie some of those threads together, those themes that we see in Scripture, make connections. And it was so much fun. And I told Lindsay when we left, and I told the young women there, I said, what you don't understand is we live in a culture that thinks they know better than God. It sounds much like the period of the judges when everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And because we have rejected God, he is allowing us to self-destruct. He is allowing us to hit that downward spiral of moving away from him. And that's when God begins to remove his hand from a nation or a people or a person when we begin to worship the creature ourselves (laughs) instead of the creator. And how important it is, I said, Lindsay, you have no idea How God is going to use you to not only change these women's lives, but to help them know and understand who God says he is and to understand his truth so they can pass it on to their children. So they're better women, wives, mothers, daughters, sisters, friends. And not only that, they will impact their sphere of influence. Not even just their family. It'll go beyond their family. And you are investing in them. That's how we change a culture. It's person by person. It's sharing the gospel. It's getting them in the word of God so that we know God's word and we're living according to his truth. Another thing we need to understand is when God talks about judgment begins with the body of Christ, when he sends out revival, it's usually the body of Christ that repents first of our sin. And I believe that's one reason we're not seeing God move in a manifest way like some periods of history have experienced. It's because there's sin in the camp. It's because we become apathetic and complacent in our walk with God and we're tolerating the things of society and allowing them to come into his body. But when God manifests himself in the midst of a people, the first thing that happens is they repent of sin. (laughs) Suddenly we see ourselves as God sees us. That's exactly what happened to Job. When God revealed himself, (coughs) he was ready to repent, right? That's the first thing he did. He repented because he had seen God. He had encountered God. And when God allows us to encounter him like that, we immediately see ourselves as sinful. And we want to repent of it, be cleansed from that sin, so that we can walk intimately with him and be used by him. And the next thing that happens in revival then is because the church is so changed and the manifest presence of God is in the midst of the church, lost people flock in. They come in because they want what we have. What we have is not superior knowledge. What we have is a superior Savior. We have Jesus Christ, who without whom we would be lost and without hope. It is not because we have done anything good or we have earned any privilege with God. It is simply because at one point in our life, we humbled ourselves and said, I am a sinner, and I am so sorry, and I need you. I need you. Save me, Lord Jesus. And when we cried out to him, he saved us. That's exactly what the Bible says he will do. And now we're on that sanctification journey of getting to know him. And that's why we cannot listen to the counsel of the world without taking it and making sure it lines up with the word of God. So be very careful who you listen to. I don't care if they're on the internet, radio, television, and claim to be a believer, and they're teaching God's word. As they're teaching it, open it up. And make sure that what they're saying lines up with the truth of God's word. And there are obviously 
very great teachers of the Word of God out there. Find those, and if you need to know some of them, let, you know, ask me. I'll give you some. There are several of us that listen to podcasts and listen to teaching. It's important to feed your spirit, and I love to do that. I love to listen to other teachers, and you, there are solid teachers out there that you can listen to, but you be careful and make sure, even them, that what they say lines up with the truth of God's Word. We also need to understand that God alone is and has truth. You know, God began with Job by pointing him to creation and revealing his power, his omniscience, the fact that he's all-knowing and all-powerful. One of the things that Henrietta Mears said about the book of Job, she says, as so often is true with us, when Job came into the presence of God, he forgot the speech he thought he would make. You know those questions you think you have for God? (laughs) The moment you see him, they'll be gone. (laughs) Suddenly you will see clearly things that you now see only dimly. And she went on to say there was no arguing with God. Finally, Job went flat down on his face, repenting in dust and ashes in Job 42.6. This is the only place to learn God's lessons. On your face, with your mouth shut. (laughs) Ever been there? I know I have. There have been times in my life where God has, as I say, what he does with my heart sometimes is peels a layer back. It's like an onion. It's peeling it back one layer at a time and revealing wrong motives, attitudes, jealousies, unforgiveness, whatever it may be that's in there that maybe I've glossed over or even forgotten about. And God will reveal or maybe an unkind thing that was said. And you have to repent of that. As God reveals it to you, that's what you want to do. You want to repent of it. And there are times I have literally been on my face in the carpet and said, God, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. How could I have been so arrogant to think that I knew better than you? How could I have stepped off into the flesh so easily? God, I I am so sorry. Please forgive me. There are times I just go down, flat on my face on the carpet, and I know you've experienced it as well. And then we need to go back and remember what we said the very first week we met. God is good, and he only does good. And you look at a Job situation, you think, now wait a minute. How is that good? One of the things God was teaching us is that he is all-powerful. Satan was limited in what he could do. And the things that we value that are temporal can be gone. And as long as we have him, he's all we need. And we see that Job realized that as well. And we also need to understand that God uses the crucible of suffering to conform us to Christ. God used it in Christ's life. He suffered. And the Bible is very clear that not only will we enjoy the fellowship of the believers and the the knowing of him and the blessings of him, but also the fellowship of his suffering. And we will find that prosperity is a greater curse than adversity. It is when we are in those hard times, when we're faced with a crisis situation, that we cry out to God. That nothing else matters but getting a hold of him. But having other people pray for us and hearing from him. It is those difficult times in our lives that we grow most spiritually because suddenly nothing else really matters except him and connecting to him. And that's the place that Job reached. He just wanted God and God revealed himself to him. And he began by saying what? Where were you when I? Where were you when I? (laughs) And he says, I repent in dust and ashes. I was saying things too lofty for me to even comprehend. And basically, that's where all of us are. We have to choose to just trust God and to really believe that he's good and he only does good. And ultimately, the good that he does for us will glorify him, but it is also for our good. It is for our good as well. You know, there are a lot of verses in the book of Job that are frequently quoted. And I want us to look at just a few of them. So if you would open your Bibles to Job chapter 1. We're not going to look at all of these, but I wanted us to look at just a few of them. Look at chapter 1, verse 21. Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Wow. That's a powerful statement. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now turn to Job 13, verse 15. Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Nevertheless, I will argue my ways before him. (laughs) How often do we hear, though he slay me, I will hope in him, and we leave off that last part. And yet, is that not us? (laughs) 
<laughs> Though he slay me, I will hope in him. But at the same time, I'm going to make my case. <laughs> and that's okay. Look at the Psalms of David. Okay, go to chapter 19. And let's look at 23 through 27. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. That with an iron stylus and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. Now, these are some of my favorites. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh, I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold and whom my eyes will see and not another. My heart faints within me. In the midst of such pain and grief, this is something he knew. This was the bedrock of his faith. That is why Job could go through something so horrific and not sin against God with his lips. Because he believed that one day he would stand before God. One day his eyes would see his Redeemer. Now turn to chapter 23, verse 10. But he knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And we know that when gold or silver are being purified, what's, what's done to them? They're heated, right? They're put in the fire and melted down so that the impurities, the dross, comes to the surface and it's skimmed off. 18 karat gold, 24 karat gold, the higher the carat, the purer, the softer, the more pliable the gold. So carry that analogy into us as human beings and when God allows us to pass through the fire... The dross, the yuck, the ugly on the inside comes to the surface so that we can see it, confess it as sin, and have it removed, cleansed from our life so that we are what? Purer, more pliable in his hands. So that we are trusting him and believing his word in a deeper and a more intimate way. Even when circumstances don't agree with what God says, we believe God's word. That's what happens in the sanctification process that Job is expressing so beautifully. Now turn to uh, 28. And he begins in verse 12 by saying, But where can wisdom be found? Where's the place of understanding? Man does not know its value. And jump down to 23. God understands its way, and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he imparted weight to the wind and meted out the waters by measure. When he set a limit for the rain and a course for the thunderbolt. Then he saw it and declared it. He established it and also searched it out. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Sounds like a proverb, does it not? <laughs> yes. Do you see the, the incredible spiritual truths that Job had? prior to God revealing himself to him. So you understand that's how he was able to withstand what he went through. That's why God put such faith in him and said, have you considered my servant Job? Can God say that about me? Can God say that about you? Will we trust him no matter what? Because we do know that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways and his thoughts and our thoughts. Do I really believe that? And will I trust him regardless of what he allows to come into my life? And then look at, uh, go to, the, to the end, to chapter 42. And let's look at verses 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand, <laughs> things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear now, and I will speak. I will ask you, and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract, and I repent in dust and ashes. And as we walk through Scripture... What do we see everybody do when they encounter either the manifest presence of God in a pre-incarnate form of Christ or God himself reveals heaven, opens up heaven to them? We find them like Isaiah, don't we, in chapter 6, on their face, repenting, recognizing their sin, totally aware of how holy and omniscient and how gracious and merciful he is and yet how horrifically sinful we are and without hope apart from him. That's what happens when you get to know him as he really is. He's not this... Man upstairs, 
I mean, that just, oh, it just grieves me when somebody says that. But what are they revealing? They don't know the God of the Bible. They know a caricature of God. They don't know God as he has revealed himself. They don't know the holy, omnip omnipotent, omniscient one who in his grace has made a way for us to know him, to walk with him, to fellowship with him, to commune with him, to be one with him as he is one with Christ through his Holy Spirit. He has provided that for us. Once we see him, all we desire to do is to know him more and to love him more deeply and to be used more powerfully by him. Suddenly it is no longer about us and it is about him and it is about advancing his kingdom and it is about being used to fulfill his purposes on this planet because suddenly we have an eternal kingdom vantage point that is not locked to the earth, to the temporal, to the things that don't matter, to the things that are passing away. But instead we have an eternal vantage point. We have chosen to set our minds on things above and it changes everything. Our perspective is completely changed. Psalm 19. Let's turn to Psalm 19. It's a beautiful way to wrap up, Job. One of the Psalms we read last week. And you've got the passage of Scripture out of Romans 1 there that tells us God has revealed himself to us through our conscience and through nature so that we are without excuse. <laughs> and man has always known that. Look at verse 1 in Psalm 19. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens, and its circuit to the other end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. So we just talked about how beautiful nature is, how God has set up the boundaries and made it so gorgeous. And then he begins to talk about the law, the word of God. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. That's good news for all of us. If we immerse ourselves in the word of God and believe God and take him at his word, we become wise, regardless of how simple we are on our own. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. There's our sowing and reaping verse. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. What's he asking him to do? You know, we talked about peeling back the onion. That's what he's asking right here. Don't let me be involved in presumptuous sins, sins that I don't even realize I'm committing. Do not let them rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, which would also be our mind, be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Is that not beautiful? All of nature points to God. All of his word points to God. And when it becomes to us more valuable than gold and sweeter to our souls than honey, that's when we know <laughs> we have begun to immerse ourselves in the truth and the truth is beginning to take a hold of us because that's exactly what it will do. Now we're going to move into the book of Exodus with Moses. So we can flip back to Exodus looking at verses 1 through 4. And what do we know about Exodus? The first thing I think we need to understand is that God keeps his promises. <laughs> his word is always fulfilled. If you remember from Genesis 15, that's when God revealed himself to Moses and he, Moses believed. And Genesis 15, 6 says that Moses believed, or Abraham rather, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. It was salvation for him because he believed what God said, that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed and his descendants would outnumber the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. And then he cuts a covenant with Abraham and a deep sleep falls upon Abraham. And during that time, what does he reveal to him? That his descendants are going to dwell where? In Egypt, right? His descendants are going to dwell in Egypt for 400 years and that they're going to be oppressed and then that God's going to bring them back so that they can possess this land that God has promised to Abraham and to his descendants. And so we understand that God accomplished his purposes through the patriarchs as we pass through that period of Abraham, Isaac, 
Jacob, and then to Joseph, whom God used to get his people to Egypt to fulfill his word. Yes, in a most unlikely way, but isn't that how we're finding God works most often? In ways that we would not anticipate. And so Joseph is there. Jacob and all of the sons and children all moved to Egypt, and there they're protected in the land of Goshen. They're there for 400 years, and the book of Exodus opens by telling us a Pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph, who didn't remember how esteemed he had been, how used he had been to save Egypt, and how protected these people had been, and instead all he saw was a threat. These people have multiplied. There are so many of them. In fact, when they leave um, Egypt, the Bible tells us there are 600,000 men. So most people believe there were two and a half million to three million of them in all. Now, can you imagine hurting two and a half million people <laughs> through the desert? I can't. I cannot even imagine that. But we also know that God promised that to Jacob as well. He told him that that's what would happen, that when he revealed himself to Jacob in Genesis 46 and told him, go to Egypt, you need to do that. And he told him, I'm going to bless you there. You will die there, but you're, you're not going to remain there. Your people are going to come back. And he said, Joseph will close your eyes. So God fulfilled the word that he had given to Abraham, to Jacob. And we see now he's going to raise up a deliverer. He's going to raise up Moses because God's people are being persecuted and they're crying out to God for help. Um, J. Vernon, McGree, uh, uh, J. Vernon McGee said about persecution of God's people, he said, this is another attempt of Satan to destroy the line leading to the Lord Jesus Christ. Satanic attempts to cut off the line leading to Christ run all the way through the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Many attempts have been made to destroy the Jews. And it is quite interesting to note the way anti-Semitism has spread throughout the world. It is satanic in its origin, and therefore no child of God should have any part in it. It is generally people with no knowledge of God who persecute the Jews. Our politicians need to take heed. No nation will be protected that does not protect Israel and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. No people will be protected who go against them because they are God's chosen people and he will fulfill his word for them. And we need to understand this is who they are. This is how God has moved in the past to protect them and that any movement to try to destroy them is the enemy prior to trying to destroy the seed, the promised one, and now trying to destroy God's people, God's promise, because he's made promises yet to be fulfilled that will happen in the end of time. And God, we know, will fulfill his word. But that's why there's such anti-Semitism and always has been. Another thing we learn from Moses is we must wait on God's timing. F.B. Meyer says, we're all apt to run before we're sent, as Moses did in his first well-meant but ill-timed endeavor. And if you look at Stephen's sermon, Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian church in Acts chapter 7, he does a beautiful chronological story beginning with Abraham and walking through to the present time of Christ. If you ever want to just read Acts chapter 7, it's tremendous. But in it, he said that Moses supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him. Do you remember when he walked out and suddenly at 40 years of age, he's feeling this desire to be attached to his people, to get out and, and be involved with them? What do we know about Moses' beginning? He's given birth. Jochebed sees her son. He's beautiful. I think it goes beyond that. She knew this child is special. God has something special for this child. And in Moses, we see a mother giving away her child only to receive him back. And that's a beautiful picture spiritually of what God requires of us. Whether it's your marriage, your children, a dream so often is to give it away, to give it to him. So that then he takes it and gives it back to us. Maybe in a different way than we had anticipated. But it's a, it's a crisis of belief if you're doing experience in God. Where you've got to hand something over to God. And that's what she had to do. And what was the current Pharaoh doing? Having the male babies thrown into the Nile River. The Nile was a god for them. And as we get into the ten plagues, you're going to see that every plague attacked one of their gods. The final one being Pharaoh, who was worshipped as a god by killing off his, his firstborn. Um, so when we look at this, he's throwing the male babies into the Nile. So what does she do? She makes a little ark, reminiscent of the ark of Genesis chapter 6. Also a picture of Christ, being in Christ, being protected. And she places him in the very Nile River that would have been death for him. 
but protected. And puts him in the bulrushes where I think she knew Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe. And hides Miriam so that she can be watching. And when Pharaoh's daughter comes down and opens the basket, has her ladies retrieve it, she, he, I believe God has Moses cry. Look, my, the picture of my babies, my grandbabies. Now, who can resist that? What woman can resist a crying baby? And I, God moved her heart so that she said, oh, this is a Hebrew child. And Miriam immediately came out and said, would you like me to get a Hebrew woman to nurse him for you? And was, he was given back to his mother. Now, we don't know how long she nursed him. Many believe maybe four to even five years. Okay, you think about it with your children. We typically think we have 18 years to pour everything we need to pour into them, right? And to tell them everything they need to know about God and about life. And she knows she has a very small window to pour everything into him. All the stories of God's faithfulness. All the stories that have been passed down from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. All the truths that God has said about his people and how he would come and deliver them. And Moses, could you be the one? And so I believe at 40, some of those things were coming back to him. And he's seeing his people and God is saying, I want you to see what's happening to your people. I want you to be connected with them. But it wasn't yet time for him to try to deliver them in his own strength. And any time we rush and run ahead of God, we mess up. We need to wait on God's timing and listen for his voice. And that's exactly what Moses did. He saw an <coughs> Egyptian fighting with a Hebrew, and he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. The next day he comes out to Hebrew men are fighting, and he's like, well, why are you fighting with a brother? Why would you do this? And I said, oh, what are you going to do? Who, put, who made you judge over us anyway? Uh, you're going to kill us like you did the Egyptian? And Pharaoh found out, and so he has to flee. He ends up in the Midian desert for 40 years as God is preparing him to come back and deliver God's people. But Moses had to come to the end of himself just as so often we do. We have to come to the end of ourselves, as we talked about with Jacob, the thing that we naturally depend upon, maybe the very thing God touches. As it was with Abraham, the one who lied and schemed, finally comes to the point where at the time God calls on him to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, he's willing to literally go through with it because he so believes that God is going to bless the nations through Isaac that he believes God will raise him from the dead if he has to. That's how we're to believe God's word. That's how we're to stand upon God's word, that we know that we know he will fulfill what he has said and he will do it in his timing. We look at Abraham. It took 25 years for the promise of Isaac to be realized. With Jacob, he was with Laban over 20 years laboring and then going back to his homeland with Joseph 13 years at 17 is when God gave him the dreams and he would be 30 years old before he'd be second to Pharaoh after a time as a slave and then a prisoner and yet God blessed him in the midst of all of that and with Moses it's going to be 40 years in the wilderness and God is going to get him to the end of himself but he's also teaching him many great lessons he's learned how to live in the desert he's learned how to herd sheep except he's going to be hurting people now. <laughs> he's going to be leading them, but he knows the desert. And when God calls him, he tells him, you're going to deliver my people, and you're going to bring them back to this mountain, and they're going to worship me here. And that's exactly what God does. And we know Moses comes up with all these ex excuses. I'm sure you've never done that, right? <laughs> I can tell you I have. When God has called me to do things in the past, there have been times I've gone, but me, God, you know I can't do that, or I, I'm not comfortable doing that, or whatever it may be. We can come up with all kinds of excuses, but God's going to answer us the same way he did Moses. Who made your mouth? Who created you in the first place? If God calls us to do something, he is more than able to do it through us. All we have to do is cooperate with him. Not help him out, remember, but cooperate him. So what does God require? He requires of us exactly what he required of Moses, entire consecration, that he may work out his will through our heart and life, the daily food of promise, a daring to act, an utter independence of feeling on a faith which reckons absolutely on the faithfulness of God. Now, did you get that? A daring to act in utter independence of feeling. Sometimes your feelings rail against what God is asking you to do. So you have to act on faith. Regardless of how you're feeling, on a faith which reckons absolutely on the faithfulness of God, even when I can't see it, even when I don't get it, I know that God is going to come through. And when God revealed himself at that burning bush, how did he reveal himself? Remember when Moses said, well, who will I tell them is sending me? He first begins by giving him his name, the holiest name, I am. I am that I am is sending you. 
And he goes on to tell them, but you tell them, the God, Elohim, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is sending you, but I'm giving you a new revelation. I am that I am. I am, I was, and I always will be. I am the self-existent one, and I am sending you. Wow. So he went with that knowledge and that power behind him. Shepherd from the backside of nowhere to face the most powerful man in the world at the time. Only God can do that. But you know what? He wants to do that in our lives as well. And I remember back in 2000, Steve was preaching for the very first time at the Southern Baptist Convention. <clears throat> and that's kind of a big deal for pastors in the Southern Baptist Convention. He was a little nervous about it, excited about the opportunity. And we prepared and went down there with the kids. It was actually in Orlando that year. And the night before he was to preach on Sunday night, we received a phone call that his father had passed away. Now, his dad had been in a nursing home for nine years. He had had a stroke. He had Alzheimer's prior to that, um, had been on a feeding tube. Um, you know, we knew it could come, but we didn't know what was going to happen then. And so the next morning, Steve was really torn. Do I get somebody else to preach and fill that spot and go back and be with my mom? And we were really praying through that. And our phone rang in the hotel room, and it was Dr. Rogers. And he said, I want to tell you I heard about your dad, and I'm really sorry about it. And he said, but Steve, I think your dad would want you to preach. And he sat on the stage beside him and prayed over him just before he went up to preach. And it was so precious of him to do that, so Christ-like to be there to encourage him. So we went back. We went. That was our 20th anniversary, the day that we buried his dad. Um, so a lot of emotions going on then. Um, the next month, we were on vacation in California, and Steve suddenly had double vision. And, of course, we're driving a minivan with our four kids, <laughs> and one eye shut. He's like, I'm seeing, I'm seeing double. It's like, I'll drive. <laughs> Pull over. <laughs> there was an optometrist office down from our hotel. So we just walked in and said, hey, could you see him? He kind of told the guy what was going on. And so anyway, he did examine his eyes, and he said, there's nothing wrong with your vision. Your vision's 20-20. He said, you've either got a brain tumor, and he listed off all these other things. And we're thinking, oh, great. <laughs> That's good news on vacation. So we, we finished our vacation, and we came back home and went to see an ophthalmologist. And he said the same thing. It's not your eyesight. He said, but you know what? I think I know what it might be. He had seen this before, it's, it's rare, but he walks us, literally took us to a neurologist's office in the same building, got us in to see that neurologist. Within 15 minutes, Steve was diagnosed with myasthenia gravis. Well, they did test after that, and they did uh, confirm that he did, did have myasthenia, but also in the test, they found that his thymus, which is under your sternum, was enlarged. That's uh, part of your immune system, and typically as an adolescent, it begins to shrink. It's kind of like your tonsils. You need it when you're younger, and then you don't really need it. So if it's enlarged, it, it's abnormal. Something's going on in your body. But it also had a tumor on it, and so he was going to have to have that removed, and it was much like open-heart surgery. And you know when you go in for your pre-op visits, and for those of you that are in the medical field, I know you have to tell us this stuff. <laughs> It's like you just think you're going to, you know, you go and draw blood, you think you're going to die or you're going to have a stroke or whatever. I mean, so they tell you all these things that could happen, and I recognize, you know, this could be cancerous. We don't know what we're facing. We didn't really even know that much about myasthenia at the time. And so the night before his surgery, after the kids were all in bed, I got along with the Lord, and I was literally kneeling by my chair just crying out to God and saying, God, like he needed to be reminded, we have four children. <laughs> at that point, they were, Bethany was second grade, um, sixth grade, eighth grade, and a senior, going into a senior year in high school. This was in August when he had his surgery. And I was crying out to God, God, we've got four children, Lord. I am not capable of raising these four children by myself. Lord, we, we need him. We, they need their dad. I need my husband. Lord, would you please intervene? Would you please spare his life? And I'm just crying out to God. And in the midst of all that, it was one of those moments where God just envelops you with his presence. And the Lord said these two words to me, I am. I am. And immediately I knew, <laughs> he is the I am. He is my husband. He is their father. And I felt like God was saying, even if I don't heal him, if I choose to take him, am I enough for you? And I literally lifted him to the Lord as if he didn't already belong to him. But you know, it does help us to be able to do that, <laughs> doesn't it? As if that makes any difference, it makes a difference in my heart for me to just surrender him to the Lord and say, God, regardless of what happens, you are my I am. And you are sufficient. You are sufficient for any need I have. 
Now I realize that was not a Job-sized crisis. But at that point in my life, it felt really big. But for God to come through and tell me, I am. I am, I was, and I always will be everything you need. I will never leave you or forsake you. So ladies, I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what kind of crisis is looming on any of our horizons. But I do know this. The great I am of this book is here with us this morning. And if you're a believer, he not only lives within you, but you belong to him. And he fights for his own. He is, he was, and he will be everything you need. Cling to him and cling to his word. Let's pray. Oh, Father, how we love you. And Lord, how we marvel at the tenderness in which you reveal yourself. Lord, you are so gentle with us. You are so loving and gracious. And Father, I pray this morning, I know with this many women gathered together, there are many hurts. There are many mountains that may at this moment seem insurmountable. But I thank you that there is nothing that's impossible for you. And that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you are the I am of our every need. So Father, I pray for each of us today that we will fix our eyes on you. And set our mind on things above. And continue to line our life up with the truth of your word knowing that it is powerful, and that in it you have given us everything we need for life and godliness. And Lord, we ask you to fill us afresh with your spirit, to flow through us and to use us. And Lord, to help us to love you even more with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we ask it in the name above all names, the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you, ladies.